In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, how we need holy places. <laughs> it was 1974. It was the Feast of the Transfiguration at the Church of the Transfiguration in Freeport, Long Island. And a man who was becoming increasingly well known for his Trinity Institute was the guest preacher. A man by the name of the Reverend Dr. Robert Twilley. Long before anybody in Dallas had heard about him. That as he was stepping into the pulpit on that day, he opened by saying, God, how we need holy places. He took us right back to what had taken place at the Transfiguration. Once again, being able to show that something holy was taking place. But you may remember that St. Peter had a few thoughts about that. Apparently, he was a little bit of a builder. And what he had done is he looked up there. He remembered that just a while before, Jesus had given him a new name. Given him the name Rocky Johnson. And as he was given his new name and feeling very good about himself, he remembered what he had seen at Caesarea Philippi where he'd been given his new name as he stood on all the rock. Looking up into the booths where the gods had been placed. There were numerous gods that would be placed in there. The most common saint god, whatever they were calling him at the moment, happened to be the god Pan, who was the god of the shepherds in that area. They were noted, that is, the people, because whenever they prayed and looked up to those booths and looked into those niches and saw the god Pan, they all began to quiver and shake. And I think you know that's where we get the word panic from the way in which they responded whenever they were praying to these gods. But not long thereafter, with Peter now the rock ready to be taken in the inner circle to witness this transfiguration, you may recall that still fresh in his mind were niches with gods in them. And so he thinks it's a good plan. Master, it's a good thing we're here. Let's build three booths or niches. One for you, one for the other so who have come, Moses, Elijah. You may recall that at that moment, Peter had a very rapid name change again. Get thee behind me, Satan. This wasn't really the promotion he was looking for, I might add. But you see, what Peter was trying to do was preserve holiness. He also was very interested in helping Jesus immensely by offering a shortcut to glory. No pain. Let's just go right to the glory and the joy. But you and I have just gone through Holy Week. We don't go right from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, do we? We have Maundy Thursday. We have Good Friday. We have burials to deal with. And then we deal with the resurrection Dr. Terwilliger was very clear in his sermon that we need more holy places, but we can't build them with our hands. You can't just build a holy place or go into a holy place and expect it to be holy because it looks holy. Holiness does not come from hands that build. Holiness comes from the Holy Spirit that sanctifies. So holiness is something that falls down upon you this very day, as a successor to the apostles, pronounces dedications and consecrations. As wonderful places this has been, and being half Scandinavian, Swedish at that, being in a church where Norwegians worshiped could bring up some Oli and Lena jokes, but it will not. <laughs> But Scandinavians came to this country with a different understanding of church than many others did. 
For them, the work that was going to be done here was an extension of the work that they had done over there. And one of the things that they always waited for was a bishop to show up. Not too many. For those of you who really are interested, that's one of the reasons why the very first graduate of Neshota House was Scandinavian. He was one of the ones that they were waiting for who would one day be able to offer ministry. And as Scandinavian churches in this country kept waiting for bishops, and they never quite showed up, what eventually happened is many of them became Anglicans. In the Diocese of Quincy, I would go into some of my Anglican buildings and I would see a name like I just saw in there, Ingeborg Nielsen, not exactly something from Oxford. <laughs> And so the blending here of the Lutheran and the Anglican presence today is remarkable. It's extraordinary because both groups came with a sense of missionary zeal. Scandinavians came with missionary zeal so that they could do the work where they were supposed to be. And now a group of Anglicans with missionary zeal have come in to continue the task that was set forth. This is not an ending of something that was here before. This is a continuation of something that was dreamed of. A dream that the people of God would become touched by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in such a new and remarkable way as holiness comes upon us this very day. If I may put it just a little differently though, this is definitely not the Wallace's living room. <laughs> this does not look like the group that we would gather with, nor am I having to vest out of the trunk of my car. <laughs> Carried by beautiful children who are no longer children anymore, I might add. But it's because of endurance and it's because of fortitude, gifts of the Holy Spirit, that we are here today. And I would also add that this is a gift to your bishop. This is a gift to your bishop. It's a gift to your bishop because it's not easy being a bishop, but particularly right now, uh, additional prayers are needed for your bishop and for your diocese. But isn't this what he has always wanted? More churches, places that could be consecrated. Look around you for just a moment. How many of you have never been to a church consecration in your entire life? Put up your hand. Now, folks, what you're also noting are some clergy who are putting up their hands. So you see, this is what the church is supposed to be about. This is what her mission is, is to consecrate churches with consecrated people. People who have been consecrated in such a real way by the consecration of the bread and wine to become the body and blood of Christ so that you become holy as he is holy. What Dr. Terwilliger was really saying that day was simply because it looks churchy does not mean that it is holy. But as I look around and I see all of you, gathered together at this time with joy, excitement, and anticipation. I see God's holiness permeating you in a most remarkable way as I look into your eyes, into your faces, and don't become self-conscious, your body language. Because you are attentive and ready ready to receive the next step. And that's why you will notice that all of these dedications and consecrations are filled with a sense of anticipation. Put differently, this isn't the end of the trail. And as I pointed out to you, this isn't even the beginning. This is the continuation of ministry in this place, ministry in a living room, and ministry in the hearts and the lives of people before us. Even the proper preface, which very few people know because they've never been in any place that it's needed much, that is used at the Mass at the consecration of a church, speaks to what St. Peter was telling us in the epistle today. The proper preface says, 
through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, in whom we are built up as living stones of a holy temple, that we might offer before thee a sacrifice of praise and prayer, which is holy and pleasing in thy sight. You, my friends, are living stones. Years ago, when I was for my first time in the city of Nazareth, and I was at Christ Church Nazareth, our Anglican presence in the city, I was with my friend, a man who had become a very close friend of mine over the years, named at that time Father Ria Abu Asl. And Ria was telling me that he loved the fact that we came to see the stones. But he said, if you will, I would like from now on to show you the living stones. And so I was taken to the hungry. I was taken to the homeless. I was taken to the Palestinian Christians who have a tough identity in Nazareth. A tough identity because of the fact that they just don't fit in in many places, being Palestinians and Christians at the same time. And as I looked at the living stones there, I realized the sacrifice that each one of them had made, sometimes on behalf of the stones. And I want you to know this today. People can take away bricks and stones, but they can't take your soul. They can rearrange and they can threaten you to take away anything they want. But when the Holy Spirit is fully in you, and you are the church, all they get is what is the leftovers. We are blessed to have places that are starkly significant, and well they are. But today you are the ones who are significant in this place. This place is just a nice building without you. And you are the living stones, just as those holy sites in the Holy Land are. You are the living stones that will bring them alive. I could take you to numerous monuments in the Holy Land today, beautiful churches, and I can get you in because I know the Muslim who owns the keys to many of those places and get you inside those Christian churches that are unused. No worship in them, nothing happening in them, because all the living stones are gone. But the living stones that are a part of life here are going to make the difference. For those of you who are about to be confirmed, you are being placed in a situation where you become a part of a dynamic movement, a dynamic movement. It's just not a matter of your bishop anointing you on the forehead for all of you checking to see which one gets the the biggest slap on the cheek it's not just a matter of the oh they didn't tell you that part did they and the laying on of hands for the outpouring of the holy spirit but you have come through a situation where you entered the door through the oil of exorcism today that's right you have come through the catechumenate. You have been formed. You haven't just shown up. Living stones that have had no opportunity to be fit become walls that fall down. Living stones that have been fit become a remarkable opportunity for God's work to be done because you will hold together. In fact, when log cabin churches were being built in this country, the specialists who built them after they had carved each one and fit one in always wrote on the top of one of the logs from the scriptures, fitly joined. Meaning that as the logs were now fitly joined, so you had to be fitly joined with one another in the body of Jesus Christ. And that's why we have a consecration today. Not because of the fact that we want simply to be able to tell people it is done. 
but rather so that you can go forth as missionaries. And I've known your rector for a long time. He will be blessed to know that I will not repeat any stories. He was a good camper at Camp Crucis when I was a counselor many years ago. Uh, he was a perfect gentleman at my daughter and son-in-law's wedding. Well, he's always been a perfect gentleman, and all of you know that. And today he's finally going to be institutionalized for it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, instituted. <laughs> but you see, that means he's being put into the institution in a particular way because he is the one who's going to continue to work with each piece that fits together so that this temple may grow. These walls may never get bigger, but it was taking place on the inside will continue to grow. I'll leave you with a few thoughts because tomorrow, tomorrow you're going to have a chance to hear a little bit about a man who doesn't always get good publicity, St. Thomas. But what many people forget is that he is the only apostle after whom a whole communion or denomination is named. There are parishes named after saints, but find a whole denomination in American parlance or communion that's named after saint and you struggle. The church in India, one of the primary churches in India is called the Martoma Church. It's named after Thomas. And the reason it's named after St. Thomas is because when he was sent out, as the other apostles were, he was sent to India. And from what we can determine, he may have been the only one who also did what Jesus did in some of the ministry, and that is that he was also a carpenter, from what we can determine. In fact, he had been hired by the emperor to be able to build a palace, a marvelous palace. But St. Thomas looked into the streets and he saw hungry people. He saw bad neighborhoods. He saw difficulties. He saw people who were homeless. And he started giving all of the money and the jewels and everything else away because he couldn't stand it. But the day of reckoning came and the day of reckoning is when the emperor called St. Thomas in and said, Where, where's my palace? And he says, um, well, uh, it, it is out of view, it's out of sight. Well, the emperor was pretty unhappy. Finally, he said, I want my gems, I want my wealth back. And St. Thomas says, come with me. And he went out onto the front porch of Christ Church in Waco. And he says, there's your jewels. There's your gold. There's your treasures under bridges, in homes that are falling down, in places where people have no food. You see, those are your gems, and those are your jewels. So beloved, a consecrated space is where we gather together for the purpose of going out and doing ministry. We gather here for the purpose of being built up so we can do the ministry that was set before us. And you, my dear friends in Christ, know with all of your heart, you can't make anything holy. God does. And God, how we need holy places. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.